Welcome back to Blurry Creatures. This week we have Rob Skiba on the show. Rob's been in this space for a long time, Luke, and uh, we had a great interview with him. Heavy. Yeah, real heavy. Heavy. <laughs> heavy. You know what's funny, Nate, is that my wife has made this suggestion, and I'm going to call her out now, that when we start our show, she thinks that we should introduce ourselves every time. <laughs> yeah, well, we, you got to keep it a little vague so that people go back and listen to the older We're like, ones. who's this guy? Who's this guy that sounds like, like Darius Rucker? She makes a good point, though. People do tune in, and they don't know what they're getting themselves into. We just like to launch it into it. We Nate. do. Well, the good thing is, Luke, we learned on this episode there is salvation for hybrids. Yeah, I guess. So, or at least that's a theory. That is a theory. It's interesting because it's it's not unlike what we talked about with Dark Waters in the episode before, previous to this one, about how he was talking about the hybrids and the werewolves and stuff that are out there, and mm-hmm. it's a you know it's an empty vessel, as he would say. Like there's the reason this is happening is that these, but aren't those chimeras though? Yeah. I mean, but that's, and that's part of the, I think it's interesting is the idea of, I mean, I was listening to Gary Wayne a little bit today, just, he was talking about, you know, our earthly bodies versus our heavenly bodies versus our resurrected bodies. And it's like the Bible talks about body, spirit, and soul, and how Adam was, had the breath of life breathed into him. There's all this crazy stuff in the scripture that makes us uniquely who we are as human and not angelic and not other. Mm. But I don't think we, and Rob talks a little bit about it. But the idea in Dark Waters kind of touched on it. There's something to be said for missing one of those pieces, right? And mm-hmm. I think maybe some of those pieces is maybe the soul, I'm guessing. If that's what was given to us by God to make us uniquely human, then... But then you talk about the redemption, so then they... I don't know where to go with this, except that that's just... It's all it's all way smarter than I am and interesting stuff that we haven't really delved into too, too, too deep on the show. Well, it's definitely turning into more than just cryptid creatures podcast you know these the theological threads are getting deeper and deeper and heavier and heavier and harder and harder to hear yeah yeah you know dark waters brought up a lot of things and 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 so did rob that like what i like about this interview with uh, with rob luke is he kind of talks about these two ages of the golden age between jared and noah and then after the flood kind of some theories about the chimeras were the majority of the problem post flood and I never really heard that from any other previous... I haven't heard that at all. Yeah. It's a fascinating idea. And then, I mean, it's funny how the last... I feel like we're, we're starting to delve into this whole Nimrod thing, too, which is, you know, a part of the Bible that... You know, there's some, we talk about the Tower of Babel. We've all heard that before. But to really understand what's going on there. And then to look at the extra biblical stuff when you look at Jubilees and Jasher and the depth of detail that we, that we get surrounding mm. that. Well... Someone was saying, I think it was Rob actually on a podcast I was listening to before we interviewed him, that the base for the Tower of Babel was estimated to be 100 square miles, maybe even 200 or something insane. It was an insane number. How big the base of the tower had to have been yeah. in order to build it as high as they were trying to build it. You know, and as I was thinking about what he said, there's one thing we, that I forgot to touch on with him too, is we talked about how Solomon conscripted the giants to build the temple some of the giants. And then you go, oh, wait a minute, that's not a very far jump to Pharaoh conscripting the giants to build the pyramids and these giant structures, right? And I didn't, we didn't, I, that parallel, I thought about it at the moment and then we were on the a tangent and I didn't get to return to that. But I didn't, I didn't really catch that in the Bible. And if that, I need to relook at what, what that says. But if that's what it says, hmm. there's a very good argument then that it, not only Solomon, but probably other rulers use these big, creatures to to build because the capacity for work is was exponential and strength exponential you see all these different things so maybe maybe that's some of what we've talked about in the past with the building the pyramids them being pre-flood and not only that they probably had some supernatural knowledge on how to build right from the mystery religions the mystery schools and all that i'm of the theory luke that after i've looked at these especially the ones in peru those ones that just look perfect it's almost like they floated them in the air, melted, and then when they came down, they were soft, and then they just they morphed into place, and then they cooled, and then they were perfect. That's why you can't get a hair in the joints because at one point they were like not 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 hard stone. So like for an eighties so, reference, you're talking about like they had a proverbial easy bake oven, and they just made these walls and easy bake and they baked oven. them. I think they just tapped into the sound, man. Some sort of frequency sound. They they, they could levitate things and they could they could melt them and then they could set them in place. I don't know. That's what I think they did. That's because wild. if you look That's at some wild, of those Nate. walls, you're wilding right now. 
No, I mean, I think that's, I think, I think that's when you actually get into space, a lot of people use the sound frequencies as how they cut the, they tapped into that and that's, that's the energy source. I don't think we use sound as much in this modern technology era, but anyway. We're using it right now, Nate, for truth. All right. <laughs> we are. Look at that. Look at that. Look oh, at you. Look at that. We're just the ancient knowledge right now. <laughs> yeah. You going to, you going to sing a little Rick roll for us here before we get going? You can't. You're the you're the voice guy. You're the voice guy, not me. Never gonna give you. <laughs> anyway, so Rob's episode gets a little heavy. Pretty normal blurry creatures, but some parts are a little bit heavy. So just you know, fair warning. Like um, we're pretty deep down the rabbit hole at this point in the podcast. So yeah, but I would also say, Nate, it's not anything that's not in the scriptures, not in Revelation. So oh sure. So sure, I mean, sure. yeah, I mean it's dark, but we're just talking about. You know, we we go from the beginning and we go to the end to talk about what's going, what what to expect in the end, and it's not a not a pretty picture at the end of it. It just isn't. Open your Bible. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's heavy. It, it, it could be heavy depending on where you are. I don't know. Like our listeners seem to be able to take take the hits and keep coming back for more. So maybe you never know who's listening. But you guys are awesome. You've been sending us a ton of messages. We've been getting a lot of messages, and I, and they keep sending them. We love them. We love to read them. Yeah, we've got some great stories. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Hey, boys, hey, boys at Expanded Perspective say, are saying people are seeing centaurs. Just to FYI, <laughs> like modern day people. And we had a sighting from Jerry's grandpa in, in the Great Depression of a centaur just rolling up on their farm. Oh, yeah. There's weird stuff happening out there, guys. Weird stuff. We're going to flush it out, Nathan. We're going to find it. And we've had several people say they've dug up giant bones and won't come on the show. But we're working. We're working our magic. We're trying to. We're trying to make it happen. If you've seen something weird out there, if you've if you have a story in your family, send us a message. Blurry Creatures Podcast at gmail or at Blurry Creatures on social media. Send us whatever you got. Seriously, we love to read the weird stuff. We'll put it on a blog, or maybe we'll have you on the show. We don't know. But if you've seen something, if you know something, and if you like somebody. A lot of people are sending us guests, and we sent out a few messages today to uh, Chief Joseph Riverwind, the Bigfoot Doctor. So yeah, if, all yeah exactly. You, if, you, if you've got if you've got people that you think fit in in what we do, send them our way. Cool man. Roll that time cop. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? It's I knew it, and it's it's starting to resonate with the people. It's starting to resonate with them. People, I know. People are starting to send that message on on the. Uh, you miss your opportunity, Luke. I know. Rick roll that time cop. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Rick roll. Get out of here. We <laughs> just got dad jokes on dad jokes. So welcome to the show, Rob Skiba. Rob, you're a filmmaker. You just won some awards making films. Uh, you're a radio host and author. Several books. Uh, one's, a couple of them are called Babylon Rising and and The First Shall Be Last, Archon Invasion, The Rise and Fall, and Return of the Nephilim. And uh, I like what you call yourself. You call yourself an ancient Nephilim theorist. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on Blurry Creatures. Yeah, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. So we have a tradition just to kind of get into the weird space and talk about this stuff. We ask all our guests off the top of the hour, what are your thoughts on Bigfoot? What do you think Bigfoot is? Do you have any thoughts on Bigfoot? Uh, yeah, I mean, who doesn't, you know, have at least some thoughts on that? I mean, if you live in the United States, especially, you've yeah. heard something. And if you're of our generation, you probably saw Steve Austin, the $6 million man versus Bigfoot back in the 70s. So. Andre the Giant. Andre oh, the yeah. Giant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. So of course, you know, it's funny. I went, recently uh, went through, uh, there's different uh, apps you can get and watch old 
TV shows and stuff and watched it. It is so cheesy to see that now. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. You know, as a kid in the 70s, like that was the greatest thing ever, you know. This is golden though, because it's still kind of golden though. Like the memory and nostalgia that comes along with it, even though, yeah, even though it's cheese to the, like cheese factor 10. <laughs> it was definitely. I still love watching that stuff. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, you know, as far as yeah, I believe that there's something out there that we call Bigfoot, Sasquatch. You know, and that there's uh, there are equivalent versions of this creature in other parts of the world, you know, known as the Yeti or the Abominable Snowman and whatnot. That, that these things are out there, and, and it is my opinion that these are just remnants of the Nephilim that are you know still out there. Um, in you know, you see my graphic here, Seed. We just did a teaser for the the pilot episode. It's a eight minute teaser that's meant to run before the opening title credits, and. And I said it in uh, 1942 during World War II, the beginning of World War II, uh, for the United States anyway. And uh, it was set in the Solomon Islands. And I was aware of giant creatures in the Solomon Islands. So that's why I wrote the teaser. But after I wrote it, I ended up stumbling across a book called Mysteries or Solomon Island Mysteries, I think is the title of the book. And, uh, you know, in this, it's a fascinating book. It's like this journalist that goes out there and spends some time living out there. And he's like, you could tell anybody. Marius? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. I couldn't remember the name, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Marius. Uh, he, he, he basically says you could pull anybody over on the side, you know, on, on the street and say, you know, have you ever seen a giant? And he's like, everyone will have a story. Unlike here, of course, this is relatively speaking to the United States. It's a small country you know small island uh or set of islands and you know so around here you don't find as many people being aware of or having actually had an eyewitness account of bigfoot but we've at least heard of it through pop culture and and, you know perhaps other you know people saying stuff you know but uh there like he's, he's like everybody's got eyewitness accounts or at least second or third hand you know my father did my cousin somebody they know if not themselves have seen it so yeah i'm of the opinion that that the nephilim went through a, a diaspora during the conquest of Canaan uh, when the Israelites came in, you know, Joshua and Caleb and those guys after they're wandering in the wilderness and, you know, what, what they didn't kill, they chased out and what they didn't chase out, David and his mighty men got later, you know. Um, yeah. But we see that even in the building of the temple, I think it's in what, I always forget if it's first or second Kings, I think it's first Kings chapter nine, uh, where the description is given of the building of the of the temple and it's the ites you know the, the, the canaanites that that uh, and it even says that 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 they failed to you know drive out or kill uh, solomon conscripted them to build the temple i'm like huh. what yeah. you know uh yeah it's pretty trippy i wrote a blog on that back in 2011 uh so i mean you know they they were chased out they and they went all over the world and you know they found themselves in the solomon islands they found themselves you know and i believe the conehead variety not necessarily giants i think that they were actually short people uh you know average to height to short uh you know of course la marzulis marzulis probably told you guys a lot about all that but you well, the paraca skulls and all that yeah, yeah. the conehead skulls it's not yep. just in peru the, yeah. the, those are perhaps the most famous ones but uh yeah i mean I think that there are remnants of the Nephilim in a variety of different forms and Bigfoot's just one of them. And when you say remnant, is it like, what do you mean by that? Because we've had people say that and, I'm, and I've always wanted to know, cause I feel like you're a good guy to ask this question. Like, is it like a, like a hybrid? Like, what do you mean by that? Well, that they weren't killed off. So in other words, they, some people believe the hybrids are sterile. I, the Bible refutes that. You know, I mean, it says, you know, born to the giant and Gath, right? Well, obviously, if right. Goliath is born to the giant and Gath, his dad's not sterile, <laughs> right? And he's, right, he has four brothers. He, so there's a there was a lot of yeah. You he's know, got four brothers. Panky panky going on. There. <laughs> and frankly, they're the they're the runts of the pile. I mean, right. These guys are yeah. like you know, depending on who you read, somewhere between six and twelve feet tall, probably. You know, these are, you know, some people don't even, they say the Israelites are short, so they were giant by comparison, so they're only six feet tall like now. On the more conservative side, I hear nine to 12 feet uh, tall for, for Goliath. And Agu Bashan, you know, he's like 15 to 18 feet. Uh, and these guys are, are the runts of the litter. I mean, when you go further back, you got cedar tree sized Amorites, <laughs> you know, and a cedar tree, a modest cedar tree gets to 36 feet tall. The cedars of Lebanon got to 150 feet. So even on the short side, you know, we got, you're talking 25 to 30 foot footers. So when I say remnant, you know, I, I just simply mean, you know, much later um, offspring, 
that descended mm-hmm. from those who were not killed, or, or, you know, that were simply dr- driven out of the land of Canaan that uh, were dispersed into the world. Well, the weird thing about Bigfoot is it has this animal side to it as well. Right. Well, th- see, th- this is where I would differ with, you know, guys like L.A. Marzulli and Steve Quayle and some of the, you know, other guys that have been in the Nephilim research community longer than I have. Um, many of these guys will say that there have been multiple incursions of angels repeatedly coming back and mating with women. I can find no textual biblical Hebrew reference to that anywhere, including Genesis 6, 4. It does not support a multiple incursion. Um, And so while they think that angels kept coming back and mating with women, I'm like, show me the evidence. There's, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, Whereas, and, and, and where, well, let me just back up. There was, an incursion of angels, I call it the Genesis 6 experiment that happened in Genesis chapter 6, um, that the book of Enoch goes into a great deal uh, of explanation about. It's, you know, it says 200 watcher class angels landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. Now, mm-hmm. that's a couple generations before Noah comes along, right? And it said that the first generation Nephilim, the angel human hybrids that Josephus likened unto the Titans of Greek mythology, they were to kill each other off within 500 years. That was part of the severe judgment that the watchers, their parents, had to endure was watching their beloved ones. It referred to the, their, the, the giants, their children as beloved ones. So they loved them. I mean, I know whenever I'm doing a presentation on this, I ask parents in the audience, how would you love to see your kids massacre each other? Anybody? And he'd be like, no, that'd be horrible. That'd be terrible. <laughs> you know, yeah. this was yeah. part of the severe judgment is they had to watch their own children kill each other off. And within 500 years, the, the angel human hybrids were dead. They killed each other off. So, and, and that's like 700 years before the flood. You know, mm-hmm. the days of Jared was 1200 years before the flood. So you got 500 years of the, of the clash of the Titans, right? That takes place that ends roughly 3,100 to 3,000 BC or so. Uh, and then like 75 years or so later, Noah's born and his daddy names him Rest. Why? Because they, they're living in a time after the clash of the Titans. His father's name was Despairing. He was born during the clash of the Titans, oh, you know, yeah. and Noah lived 600 years before the flood. So if, if the, the problem has been dealt with, the parents, the watchers are judged, bound, and buried. The, you know, they were judged severely, right? Sent to Tartarus and buried under the sands of the earth and whatnot. And their children killed each other off. So what happened in the 600 years of Noah's life leading up to the flood that caused the flood in the first place? Well, Genesis 6, 12 through 18 tells you that all earth and all flesh had become corrupted. How did that happen? And, and the result of that corruption was only evil and violence continually. Well, Joshua 4.18 and Jubilee 7.24 tells you point blank how that happened. And it happened through the process of genetic manipulation, of the blending of species, blending Mm -hmm. humans with animals. So where I differ with some of these other guys is I extend the definition of Nephilim to include animal-human hybridization just as much as angel-human hybridization. So so chimeras, chimerical creatures as as an extension of of the the Nephilim. Yeah, Yeah, because Genesis said that he created Yahuwah. God created everything, you know, in a very specific way within its own kind and everything was to reproduce within its own kind. And so when we start blending kinds that were not created in any image that, that our father or creator made, that's an abomination. And so this is why I extend the definition of Nephilim to essentially that which has been corrupted from the original state in which the creator made it through hybridization. And, and so the, the, the breed, if you will, of Nephilim that we had in the last 120 years leading up to the flood of Noah, those were animal-human hybrids. And I believe those are the, that's the variety that extended past the flood and continued to live you know, in the, in the days that the Israelites, Numbers 13 and whatnot, that what we are seeing in the post-flood world are the angel, or excuse me, the animal-human hybrids. And so that's where you might end up with creatures like the Coneheads, that, you know, perhaps if you ever look at the skull of a gorilla, you know, it's got that nice long skull. Yeah. Um, we we Big look foot. at Bigfoot, same thing. He's got that nice yeah. big long skull and he's got all this hair and stuff. Now, of course. So, Rob, Rob what about the post, what about the post flood giants then? Like, like the Goliaths? Yeah. You thinking they have the, they've got animalistic, they have an animal, they're yeah. chimerical DNA then, I, as opposed to being yes. like the pre, like, okay. Yeah. So, okay. If the angels didn't come back and mate with women, the question is, how did the Nephilim return after the flood? Now, right. here's the thing, you, my detractors who are all about the multiple incursions, we both have the same problem. <laughs> the net result is there's Nephilim after the flood. So for whatever right. reason, in his divine sovereignty, our creator 
decided that he wanted to have Nephilim after the flood too. The question is, how did that happen? Now, they would say more angels came down and made it with women. And I'm like, where's the verse? You know, where does it say that? And they will say in Genesis 6, 4, there were Nephilim in the earth in those days. And also after that, and they'll say, see, after that, post-flood. I'm like, no, <laughs> when's the, there were giants in the earth in those days. The question is, what days? What's the antecedent? What were those days? The days of Jared, according to the book of Enoch, right? And also after that, what? After what? The days of Jared. So, it, Jubilee 724 is in a is being written in a, 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 a pre-flood context, and it talks about the first incursion and what took place. And it says, and after this, they began to blend with animals, you know, with humans and stuff like that. And I, I'm trying to tell people, I'm like, look, the after this of Jubilee 724 is the after that of Genesis 6 4, and it's in a pre-flood context. So mm-hmm. we have no no record of angels mating with women, but when we see the the Canaanites, right? The the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, these are all the ites that the Israelites were consistently told to utterly destroy. Right. I mean, you had different campaigns of warfare where you were allowed to take women and children and animals and whatnot as spoils of war. But Whenever you're dealing with these specific groups, and these were Canaanites, you were told they, the Israelites were told to utterly destroy them, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everything. So I'm like, well, what's the difference? Why is it over here you can ca- capture women and children and animals as spoils of war, but over here you have to utterly destroy everything, including animals, women, and children? And, and it's because these are the ites that were the Nephilim offspring. These are the Canaanite giants, the offspring of Canaan, are the are the giants. Well, if angels didn't do it. Well, we got giants after the flood, and the uh, Noah and his wife are pure. It says Noah was righteous in his generation. The Hebrew yeah. word used there is tamim. That's the same yeah. word used for genetic purity for like the pure red heifer without spot or blemish. And according to the extra biblical text, Noah married, uh, I think it was the daughter or granddaughter of Enoch. So, you know, look, Enoch was so righteous, God took him. So, so he walked with God. Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. we know that she's a good bet that she's she's pure, pure right? So if, if Noah and his wife are pure, it stands to reason that Shem, Hem, and Japheth also, also have to be pure. So Occam's razor, what's left? There's no ain't the wives. The wives. That's all you have left. And you'll notice that none of the the relatives of the wives made it onto the ark, right? No brothers, no siblings, no cousins, no parents. You know, so only no one is and his wife were pure, which means his three sons are pure. So all you have left are the wives. And Genesis 9, 18 and 19, for me, is a smoking gun that obliterates the multiple incursion thesis. It says that you know, the three sons of Noah were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And of these was the whole earth populated. So I'm like, there you go. That There had to have been genetic corruption still in the DNA of the three wives, or at least one of the three wives, you know, perhaps two of them, or perhaps all three of them. What I found in my research is that there's something you can do called a Punnett square, and it's a way of determining odds, so, so to speak. So we know as men here, you know, the three of us, we have X and Y chromosomes, right? Women have two X chromosomes. So as long as there's a 100% genetically pure male, you have a 50-50 chance of having a 100% pure offspring, even if the wife is a 50-50 hybrid. So if you imagine the two X's, right, 50-50, let's say one X is corrupted, one is good. If she contributes her good X and he contributes his good X, you get a 100% normal female. Good X, good Y, 100% normal male. But if she contributes her bad X and his good X, you get a 50-50 hybrid female. Good Y, 50-50 hybrid male. So Mm -hmm. I'm of the opinion that that's what we're seeing in the post-flood world is the carryover of tainted genetics that, that led to gigantism and perhaps other manifestations like the Bigfoot type of character or the conehead types of characters and things of hey, that Rob, nature. We've, we've talked about, about some, a lot of this in, in the show. Um, do you think that expression happens? I mean, do we see it happen with Nimrod? Is that where it really begins, like to the genetics begin to express itself? Because we've had the theories, right? And there is the second incursion or multiple incursion. And there's also the wife of Ham. Usually she's usually the culprit. Right. Um, because out of her right. come Moloch and Nimrod and that whole line of, I'm not even sure if I'm getting in order, right. but that to that point, we get to the Tower of Babel and all the stuff that happens in Jasher. Yeah. We see in the extra biblical as well. Do you buy that theory that, that that's, because what's interesting about what you're saying to me is that the characteristics of what they describe for Nimrod, the animalistic things that happened to, sort of happened to him, mm-hmm are kind of following that. And we, Nate and I haven't covered this. We haven't covered like this kind of theory where it could be the, the chimerical is how you have the giants as opposed to 
And we've had a lot of, I mean, it's all theory. We, no one knows. We can go, we can't, we won't know yeah. until we stand before God. Right. But, you know, there's the whole idea that genotypes express and then don't express or turned on and off. And then you could have had that with Well, and it. the cultic, like, occult practices could turn you into something as well, like, you yeah. know, sex acts and other things. We talked about like the that. Ba- they were trying to do the Babylon workings, possibly, or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, well, I'm of the opinion that likely all three of the wives, because uh, there were sisters, uh, were, were tainted. Um, uh, so then what determined the odds of their offspring? Well, I think scripture tells you that the sins of the fathers are passed down to the third and fourth generation. I like to say generation, right? Mm. That there's something yeah. genetically mm. that gets that, that, that there is a spiritual component to DNA. It's not just physical because why else would a, a moralistic choice that has spiritual consequences get passed on genetically to third and fourth generation, unless there's a spiritual link to the physical of our DNA. So I'm of the opinion all three were likely tainted uh, in some way. So what determined the odds then? Well, I would say, biblically speaking, obedience, because those who obey the creator, they're blessed for a thousand generations. Those who disobey, it's passed down to the third and fourth generation. Mm. So we see Shem, you know, he's ultimately the ancestor that leads to Yeshua, the savior. So, uh, you know, he's not perfect, but he's clearly the one that's walking in righteousness. He becomes the Melchizedek that Abraham encounters later in Genesis 14. Uh, Japheth, um, there's uh, not biblically speaking, you don't find evidence of this in scripture, but outside of the Bible, you you find some rather intriguing evidence that there were offspring, that some of Japheth's offspring were giants, namely Gog and Magog. Uh, All you have to do is Google giant plus Gog and Magog, and you'll find plenty of things written about it. In fact, to this day, there's the Lord Mayor Parade that happens in the UK every year that honors the Nephilim giants of Gog and Magog, and they march these two huge giants through the streets, you know? So, that's crazy. you know, so there's at least some giants in Japheth's line. Ham was not cursed. Canaan was cursed. You know, some people make the mistake of saying Ham was cursed. No, Canaan was cursed. Ham did something wrong, but Canaan was cursed. But he has four children, right? He has Canaan, he has uh, Mitzrayim, he has Put, and he has Cush. Well, uh, we know that there's giants all over Canaan. You know, that, that's they're the Canaanite giants, right? Mitzrayim is Egypt, and uh, um, he has a couple of children, or he has several children, but Kaftarim and uh, Kashluhim are children of Mitzrayim. And Kaftarim, the, the Kaftarim, Kaftor settled the island of Crete. Well, Crete used to be known as the island of, of Kaftor, and it's from Kaftor that we get the Philistines. So we know the giants are in of the oh, Philistines, wow. right? Goliath and his brothers. Uh, they're born to a giant in Gath. So there are at least some giants that come out of Kaftor. And what intrigues me about that is that Crete is where all of Greek mythology originates. So when you think about the Greek gods and then, you know, the hybrids and the centaurs and you know, all these weird yeah. things. The Minotaur. Yeah, the, the, I, we went, on my honeymoon, we went to the Crete. Nice. So we went to the, we went and saw like the um, Knossos where the, yeah. supposedly the Minotaur lived. I mean, you think of that like the. Yeah. Yeah, those hybrids all were the, started there. Yeah, they're everywhere in in mythology. Yeah, we call it myth. Uh, you know, and I've right. I've referred to it as mythology myself a number of times. But I've got a friend of mine uh, who grew up in Greece and speaks Greek fluently, and he corrected me one time. He said, "Rob, you keep saying mythology, but I got to tell you something." He said, yeah. "Growing up in Greece, we were taught this as history." <laughs> the same way you're taught about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, we're taught about Hercules and Apollo, and you know all, all that stuff. So yeah. For Judd them, Burton, we had cool. Judd Burton get on, and he Judd's he, awesome. Yeah, he kind of yeah, yeah. he kind of deconstructed the word, what that word really means. So, the Rafa. so just oh, the to, Rafa, just to, that was a great talk, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really was. Yeah. Just to go back, I, I you know maybe this is a dumb question. It's it's it kind of sounds like you're describing like two ages of the golden age and then post flood, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, even in the Greek myths and other myths as well, you have multi-tiered uh, generations of gods, right? You have the Titan gods, and you have like the uh, you have the uh, the Olympians, right? You know, have the demigods. You have multi-tiers. You have uh, the Anunnaki, the Agigi. You know, when you get to like Sumerians and stuff like that, you know, multiple cultures will have these this concept of a multi-tiered god structure, right down to the normal man right but with demigods and various levels of gods before them uh so uh, all that to say you, you have ham had uh he came in their giants all over the place you have some giants at least through kaftarim of mitzram but also if you look in egyptian uh, hieroglyphs and, and you know t- 
temple paintings and stuff, they have lots of depictions of giants and sculptures of giants, you know, in, in Egyptian. So Mitzrayim himself could have been a giant, you know, um, certainly to have produced uh, the Kaftarim giants. Um, there's no evidence of giant offspring in Put that I'm aware of. Put is uh, settled what we now call Libya. Um, I am actually of the opinion that Put may have been the offspring of incest, that Ham may have had some sort of sexual relation with his mother, and that Put was the offspring of that, but that's a whole other <laughs> study. <laughs> and then Cush, um, Cush has Nimrod, but Nimrod, he wasn't born a Nephilim. It says that he began to become yeah. a Gabor, right? And what I found in my research that, that fascinated me, because you have the Hebrew word Gabor, the plural Gaborim, meaning mighty men, um, is that the Hebrew scholars, they understood contextually the difference between Nephilim Gabor and just strong, valiant men, you know, like David's mighty men. David's Gaborim right. were busy killing Nephilim. So they're not Nephilim, right? And so, but what the, the, uh, the Hebrew translators that translated their Hebrew text into Greek, into the Septuagint, they knew the difference. And they translated the same Hebrew word, Gabor or Gaborim, two different ways. Uh, uh, forgive me, I might butcher this, the scholars out there, so I'm sorry, this is going back a bit in my memory. But uh, I believe that where it's in reference to David's mighty men, it's like uh, Tone Dynaton or Tone Dynatos or something, that the root word is the same word that we get dynamite from. So th that's the Greek word that they chose to translate the Hebrew word, Gabor or Gaborim, regarding David's mighty men. But when it came to uh, Nimrod, they chose Gigas which is the root word we get for gigantic, giant. Mm. The, the, and mm. the Septuagint just comes right out and tells you, Nimrod began to become a giant in the earth. It just right. comes out and tells you point blank. But all that to say is that contextually, historically speaking, the Hebrew scholars knew the difference in how they translated the exact same Hebrew word two different ways. So how did Nimrod become a Gaborim uh, in the sense of a gigas or gigantic or gi a giant, as the Septuagint says? Um, this is speculation, but... I think it's reasonable speculation. If we were approaching this as investigators, right, we, we are detectives looking at the clues at the scene of a crime or something. Well, we see in Jubilees, the book of Jubilees, it describes an individual named Canaam who is missing from the uh, uh, King James Table of Nations, um, who is a son of Arphaxad. He's, he's omitted in the King James. Uh, he is in the Septuagint and other translations uh, of the Table of Nations in Genesis. He's there. And this son of our, so you have Shem, Arphaxad, or Canaan, and you have, uh, um, you have Ham, Cush, Nimrod. So Nimrod and Canaan are first cousins, right? And it says Canaan found some writings of the Watchers from the pre-flood world. And it says he sinned because of it, and he hid it from Noah. And that's all you get. That's all the information you get. Huh. So I'm of the opinion that there was some sort of formula on that watcher document that Canaan found and likely Nimrod, you know, being first cousins, this is the way I envisioned it in my head. Speculation, I admit it, is that, you know, Ham's sitting there with his buddy, you know, his cousin Canaan, and they're looking over at their other cousins, the Canaanites who are, you know, pushing 30 feet tall now. <laughs> and they're like, what's the deal, man? How come, you know, <laughs> you know, we all got the same grandpa, right? You know, how come, how come, how come these guys are giants and we're not? And Canaan's like, I don't know, maybe this has something to do with it, right? And Ham's like, uh, uh, Nimrod's like, give me that. And when the, the Hebrew word there for this translated began, where it says he began to become, it's, um, I forget what, it's Chalal or something, I forget the exact word, but it's this, this, the same word is used later for words like sexual defilement and prostitution. Uh, so linguistically, it appears, at least to me anyway, that through some sort of sexual defilement, likely due to the writings found on the watcher tablets nimrod did something to himself that began to change him at a genetic level Yeah, it's like we it's like we our view of genetics is we, we, we feel like it's a totally passive thing, but it can actually it sounds like you can activate genes oh, you can. as well. It's not just a passive thing. 
Yes, through um, this was a something that was at least new to me. Let me, let me put that. I don't know if it was new on the world stage, but when I was doing my research for Archon Invasion and, and tracking down this path of genetic manipulation and genetic carryover on the Ark, uh, it was around that same time that I started seeing documentaries on like the History Channel or Discovery and seeing YouTube videos pop up, you know, TED Talks and whatnot about the, the study of epigenetics. And epigenetics, it's like for forever it has been assumed that our genes are sort of set in stone, right? Whatever you, whatever you get, you got, right? And you can't change that. Uh, but then they found this, that there's what they call epigenetics, epi meaning on top of it, that there's, there's this, I don't know what you call it, stuff, I guess, on top of DNA that can be influenced by the environment, by things that happen to you, by things that you do, by things that you consume, food that you eat, that that, that can affect the epigenetics. And the epigenetics, if you imagine the ladder of the DNA, right, you get the GA, T, C, A, you know, the, you know, the codes of, of uh, DNA, the ladder, right, and how they connect like this, and they're on off switches. So, epigenetics have the ability to turn an off switch on and an on switch off. So if certain on off switch codes uh, manifest in a certain expression of genetic traits, well, through epigenetics, you can change those genetic traits by turning on, you know, turning on or off various, uh, you know, switches. So the study of epigenetics was fascinating to me in some of the, some of the case studies they did with animals and stuff like that. And I'm going, to me, that's exactly what happened with Nimrod and probably what happened with the original uh, uh, animal-human hybrids. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you about that because like post-flood, you have these animal-human hy hybrids. Yeah. Like I w the obvious question is, how did they do it? It was just the watcher tablets and they just could... Well, th some of those genetic traits may have been, the wives may have had them. You know, now, w did they express them? That's the question. You know, w were they walking around like satyrs? I don't know. I, I, I we don't. And, and what's strange to us, of course, we we think in terms of satyrs and minotaurs and centaurs. You know, that's fantastic. That's wow. That's in, what that is so bizarre because it's so outside of the box of anything that we're used to that any of us have experienced in our lifetime. But when you look back in the ancient record. These things are written about it. You know, it's, it's, you know, they write about a satyr the same way they write about a donkey or a horse. Right. You know, and, and Joshua talks about this guy that he lost some of his donkeys. He goes out looking for him and he finds in a, in a cave, there's creatures described from the waist down as a, as a, like a goat and from the waist up as a human that's messing with his donkey. So he kills it, you know, and, but it's written just, you know, yeah, I killed a goat. You know, I mean, it's written very matter of fact. Just, yeah. And we read it and we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've we've covered in our show, just so you know, on the arc of our show, we've covered a lot, you know, of the Kurds and what happened, Genesis six, Deuteronomy thirty two, all these different things that happened that led to the giants. And we are a creatures based show, so we talk about it in terms of creatures, but the giants fit into this, and then, you know, the theology fits right in. I mean, it, it, it it's turnkey into all this. Yeah. But what do you what are your thoughts on 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 that the DNA thing we're just talking about the epigenetics, yeah. and where we are now, and what might be ahead because we. People talk about, uh, you know, the Nephilim still, Nephilim stuff still remnants. We talked about remnants earlier, still being around. And mm -hmm. we know that, biblically speaking, that the end times, and if you, you know, if you subscribe to there being that we're in the end times, a lot of people do. I think Nate and I kind of do as well, or kind of we do. Um, that it's supposed to be like the days of Noah yet again. Right. Yeah, that's the key phrase right there. Because we, we see in Matthew 24, for instance, the disciples asked Yeshua, hey, what's it going to be like at the end, right? And, well, first thing he says is, let no man deceive you. <laughs> be not deceived. That's the first thing he, he talks about, right? And then he goes through this long list, you know, of things that are wars, rumors, of wars, famines, you know, pestilence, all this stuff. Well, I mean, we've had those forever, right? We've always had those. Right. So yeah. that's why everybody, everybody, every generation is thought they're going kind of in the end yeah. times, right? Oh yeah. There's all this stuff going yeah. on. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. of course in the, in the end, they're going to happen in increasing measure. There's going to be more of it, but we, the point is that's always been there. You know, yes, it's going to increase, but, but then he says for, as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be at the coming of the son of man. That's the differentiation right there. And you have to ask that question, right? Well, well, what differentiates the days of Noah from any other time in human history? And it was an angel-human hybridization. It was animal-human hybridization, as, as detailed at great length, <laughs> you know, in, in multiple ancient texts, but specifically in Joshua chapter 4 and Jubilee 7, you know, and Genesis alludes to it by the corruption of all flesh. 
that that is the primary marker of, of, of differentiation from any other time in human history, right? Is that. And, you know, they often say whatever we're hearing in mainstream right now, they, you know, whoever they are, they are right. probably easily 20 or 30, you know, maybe even 50 years ahead, you know, in, in, in advancement. You know, we, we are we are only now being made, the information being, we're, we're privileged to the information now. Um, right. You know, and, and having served eight years in the military, I mean, I didn't see a whole lot, but at the time that I did, there's stuff that we knew about in the military that the civilian world didn't, you know, become privy to till, hmm. you know, quite some time afterwards. So how long, how, how far in to the days of Noah are we? You know, when you, when you look at the time that Noah preached repentance, it was 120 years. And th those are the hundred, the latter 120 years of Methuselah's life, right? It, um, 600 years Noah lived before the flood, but not much is going on until you get to the last 120 years. And that's when you get to Genesis 6, 3, when he says, when the creator says that, you know, um, my, my flesh will no longer, my spirit will no longer dwell with man because he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Right. And now some people say, well, that means 120 jubilees. I'm like, it doesn't say that. It, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a nice coincidence that 120 years, uh, jubilees equals 6,000 years. That's kind of cool, but right. it doesn't say that. It says his days shall be 120 years. And it talks about his spirit, no longer dwelling with man for his flesh. Well, he's been flesh since Adam and Eve took of the fruit. Right. right. So what's going on there? And, it's my opinion that it, that was the time period that, you know, uh, God set off a flare poof, saying, hey, you got 120 years to knock it off. Yeah. And I'm going to send my prophet out there to warn you. And, and Noah did his job. You know, he was out there warning people, but they were doing it anyway. And when it says that his spirit will no longer dwell with man, what I think is going on there, this is my belief on this, is that, you know, we know from scripture that our body is the temple of what? The Holy Ghost. And that... Adam was created in the image and likeness of Yahuwah, the creator. So if you corrupt this temple, this image, such that it no longer looks like the image of the creator, he says, I'm not going to hang out with you. I'm not going in there. That's not my house no more. You messed it up. Knock it off because I want my goal is to be able to dwell in you, to be one with you, to have fellowship with you. That's my goal. Is that the Holy Spirit? Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, when we accept Christ, we believe the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, right? We become the temple of God, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. But if we corrupt this into something that doesn't look like his image, the Holy Spirit goes, I'm not going in there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This, this, this raises a question, Luke. I'm thinking about this. You know, the Bible says don't mix like different types of linens. It doesn't right. say like put new wineskins on old wineskins. Right. Is there something about God and mixtures and chimeras? Yes. Yes. Right? I'm totally against it, man. It's like, you know, and there's, it's only been in recent times that we've understood the the linen issue, right? That the mixing of wool and linen is that they, and I don't totally understand this myself, but they, they put out a frequency, as I understand it. And one's, I believe, a positive 5,000 and one I think is a negative 5,000. And when you blend them, you mix them out, they cancel each other out. You know, they're fine on their own. And like linen will like literally whisk away, you know, the heat from you and the sweat. You know, it, that's why linen is great to wear in the summertime and wool right. like retains the heat. So, it, you know, it keeps you warm. But so if you mix these two things together, not only do you have a, a non-beneficial construct <laughs> there that's sort of self-contradictory, but on, in terms of things like frequency, we everything's frequency, the whole everything cosmos was spoken into existence spoken it's a frequency so when we start messing around with things like frequencies we, and we, especially if we don't know what we're doing we are causing harm to ourselves and look the creator knows how he created our bodies he knows how he created animals and plants and everything else and he knows what's not supposed to be together and what is supposed to be together so he gives us these commandments mm -hmm. these do's and don'ts for our benefit they're mm -hmm. all for our benefit and when we violate those things, it causes nothing but harm to us. So he's very much against uh, hybridization, you know, of a wide variety, probably, you know, pretty much, I don't want to paint a broad stroke and say everything because, you know, there may be some things he's okay with, but I clearly see. Yeah, you know, like, like tacos and burritos. <laughs> yeah. of yeah. things, right? like Chocolate and peanut butter, man. <laughs> right. Are, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Initially, we know that like a lot of this genetic stuff was not only to essentially 
you know, destroy and mar God's creation, the things that he holds, you know, holds most dear, but also, you know, primarily also was to remove a bloodline for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So now we're, now we're post Messiah. Jesus has been here. Jesus will return. What does the enemy want to do? What, why, why, why is hybridization? Why is it coming back now? We're, we're seeing it. Yeah. The conditioning already begin, right? We've got Netflix running a chimerical show and they took oh. out the, the front page of the USA today. Yeah. And we've got in Japan, they're mixing ape and, ape and human DNA and, and it's in the news and yet it blips barely. No one really cares. Yeah. But ultimately, what's ultimately what, what's the purpose? Do you think? Like that's what I'm maybe my question is like I get that it's like uh, almost like a big f you to God, right? Yeah. That, that that's exactly. part of it. Part of it. I, I'm of the opinion that a, a lot of stuff that you know, I mean, we're running into the corruption of all flesh in a variety of ways. I mean, everything from chemtrails to you know fluoride and aspartame and GMOs and you name it. <laughs> what what they're doing to our air, food, and water, that is changing us on a genetic level. But then when you start getting into the medical industry and the overt blending of genetics of animals and you know fetal tissue and stuff like that, th- this is all, in my opinion, all of this is leading to some massive corruption of our flesh. And at some point, I think that we get so corrupted that we're no longer redeemable. And that's where the danger lies, in my opinion, is that, and I don't know, I don't know when you cross that line. I really, I don't, it's not for me to say, but looking at history and looking at, you know, the evidence that's available to me, it would appear that there comes a time when you corrupt your flesh so badly that you are no longer redeemable. Now there's a guy, John Darnell, this book right here, take the gospel to every creature question mark Hmm. is this, that's the title of it. The gospel to every creature. What did Jesus mean? John Darnell and he, good news for Nephilim, transhumans, enhanced humans, and anyone else who is the result of genetic experimentation. This guy is like in a sort of like a deliverance ministry kind of thing. Yeah. And he raises some really profound questions and, and issues. He might be a good guy to get on your show. Yeah. It's like, okay, you got a, let's say you got a soldier, special forces guy. You know, he was part of a DARPA experiment, uh, blending animals with humans to give them enhanced abilities, right? Is he condemned for eternity? Well, that's not for us to decide. We are to give the gospel to every creature, you know. And uh, another friend of mine, David Duvall, when asked about this question, you know, are Nephilim redeemable? Well, biblically speaking, we, we see God wiping them out <laughs> everywhere. But Danny's answer to that was, he said, wherever uh, the spirit of man is present with a heart of repentance, salvation is possible. And I was like, dude, that's the best answer I've ever heard. Now, the question would be whether or not the spirit of man is still intact and whether or not they have a heart for repentance, you know, but that's not for us to decide. Our, our job uh-huh. is to give, spread the message to every creature, you know, but at some point it would appear, especially from the Genesis uh, account, where you see Genesis 6, 12, earth and all flesh have become corrupted. You read a few verses down from that. And the result of that is only evil violence continually, right? That something happens and it just, it, that corruption causes a, 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 a very unfortunate side effect, which is only evil continually. And so th- when you understand what was going on in the last 120 years leading up to the flood, you realize the flood was an act of mercy on God's good creation, the stuff that he created and called good and very good. There was very little of it left. And his only solution is like, man, the, the way things are going, because once you release genetic expression out into the wild, it's out there. You know, it begins to proliferate, you know, He's like, if I don't do something about this, there will be nothing left of the original kinds that I created. So that was an act of love and mercy on his good creation to preserve it. But it's going to get so bad in the last days that all his only alternative is to burn everything up with fire, right. you know. And so I, where are we in the days of Noah? Are we, you know, are we at the beginning of the 120 years, if it's a direct parallel, or are we in the latter end of it? Uh, you know, I am of the opinion we're probably somewhere at least in the middle, you know, uh, in terms of what I understand to have happened in the days of Noah and what I can see happening that, you know, we are privy to as far as information goes to, as to what's happening in the world today. Either way, we are in the days of Noah. The differentiation being the blending of species, the genetic manipulation, the hybridization, that is happening today and it's very concerning to me. And it's very concerning to me. And it's very concerning.
We talked in depth about this, uh, Luke. It reminds me of our episode with Tim Alberino. Talks a lot about corrupting your own flesh. And he makes a pretty strong argument that you're going to know. You're going to take the genetic mark of the beast. Basically, you're going to convert yourself to something you know completely not human. Well, transhuman, right? Something that's, You remove that thing in your DNA, which uniquely makes you human. And then the archangels pull back, and then it is hell on earth because there is humans are no longer here. Yeah, I'm I'm concerned about that whole issue though. Uh, as far as you know, th- there's going to be a, a deception that's so great that even the elect could be deceived by. It. Now, some people say, "Well, that means see, they won't be." And I said, "Well, if that's the case, why did he start the conversation by saying, let no man deceive you?'" <laughs> and, and Paul later says, "Be not deceived." So, why do we have right. these repeated warnings to let no one deceive right. you if it's not possible for us to be deceived? And when I look at, I don't want to say certain words here because it'll get you flagged and get you, you know, blocked and deleted and everything else. But we all know what's going on in the world today, right now. And how many Christians are lining up, just falling in line, just, oh, yeah, you know, some white robe priest said it. So I believe it. And, you know, it's good for me. I'm going to do it. Well, it's, it's conditioning at the very least, right? They're conditioning to be like, oh, yeah, you need, now you need this. And now you need this. And I mean, yeah. Rob, how do you th- how do you think the alien thing plays in this? Because I think they are connected. I mean, I really do think all this is part of the same side of the coin. Uh, yeah, for sure, I do too. Um, well, first of all, I don't believe in other worlds. I don't think that there's anything else out there but us, and you know, the heavenly, and you know, there's there's the spirit realm, and there's us. Period. So, whenever we're talking about UFOs and aliens. Uh, I believe as far as the beings go, we're talking about fallen angels, demonic activity, you know, things like that. When we're talking about UFOs, I mean, you have people even within the secular UFO community like Stephen M. Greer and other people, you know, Disclosure Project and stuff who in recent years have come out acknowledging that most of what we're seeing very likely could be black budget DARPA type human engineered machinery, you know, human craft designed to put forward a, a certain, you know, Hegelian dialectic, a narrative, uh, something that they want to advance, it, likely in league with spiritual entities. So, I, look, I've seen them. I've seen very strange things, orbs and, you know, what we would consider UFOs. I've seen several times, I've seen different things that the, is what, what it sounds like, right? Unidentified. You don't know what it is. It's, it's a flying object, you know. Was it a good entity, a bad entity? I have no idea. It was just sitting there doing weird stuff, you know. Uh, have you ever looked into the 1561 flap over Nuremberg in the year 1561? No. no. <laughs> okay. There's some homework for you. I just did a show on this actually uh, this past Wednesday with uh, my friend, Tony Martin. He's the first person that, that turned me on to it. But you have the Copernican principle. The Coper- Copernicus po- um, publishes his work, right, on the revolutionary, you know, the revolution of the heavenly objects, whatever, uh, in 1543 in Nuremberg, Germany. In 1561, so just you know, a couple of decades, you know, 15, whatever, however many years later, you have this massive UFO war that takes place. Like this, and it's written about, and they have wood carvings and stuff on it, and everything. Uh, fascinating stuff. You could Google it and, and see for yourself. And like in it, the skies above Nuremberg, there was an actual massive, like yeah, UFO war. <laughs> wow. Uh, with things crashing to the earth and everything, and and my friend Tony. You know, he related the event of 1561 over Nuremberg to the events of Revelation chapter 12, the war in heaven. Now, both he and I in that talk recognize that there is a final battle that Michael, you know, he wins and kicks Satan out forever. But we were speculating and saying, you know, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been other battles. You know, there's a final war, but, you know, this war has been going on since Genesis 3.15. You know, the seed war began in Genesis 3.15. And but something ramped up in the skies over Nuremberg, Germany in 1561. I think it was a, another one in 15, I think it was 66. I have to go back and listen to it again. Um, but in short order, and then when you think about what happened after that, you get into the 1600s, of course, you have the, the Puritans coming over to escape persecution and stuff, and you have uh, the King James Bible showing up in 1611. Uh, you have the Illuminati being formed in May 1st, 1776, right? And you, know, or you have Isaac Newton getting bonked on the head with an apple in the year 1666 and comes up with the theory of gravity. Theory of gravity. You know, yeah. all this stuff. And then you get into the 1800s and you have Charles Lyell, Charles Darwin, uh, Huxley. You, you have the advancement of secular science that, that has now trumped the Bible all over the world. This is a universe, like all over the world, everybody's preaching the Copernican principle, Darwinian evolutionary model of origins. 
right? Everywhere. It, well, that's a pretty great deception right there. And it sets the stage for the idea of ancient aliens being out there. Because if you start off with the Copernican principle, Big Bang cosmolog cosmological worldview, well, eventually, even the Catholic Church started coming up with uh, the doctrine of the plurality of worlds and started thinking, well, and even the Vatican recently has put out that, look, if aliens show up, we'll baptize them, of course, dot, 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 yeah. if they need it. And the implication there is like, how do we know that their Adam and Eve didn't sin? You know, maybe they never fell. We fell. Our, our human race fell because of the sin of Adam and Eve. What if their Adam and Eve didn't fall? That would mean we have something to learn from our space brothers. They could be on a higher spiritual plane. So you can run into all kinds of problems with this idea of plurality of worlds, theologically speaking. But all of that was set in motion, coincidentally, in Nuremberg, Germany. Well, Germany is also the beginning of World War One, World War II. Of course, you have the Nuremberg trials there. You know, the Illuminati is founded in um uh, was it uh, Eisenhower or I forget the name of the, it's in Germany, whatever. I always wonder why is Germany such a hotspot? Well, I don't know, but it seems to go back to at least 1543 with the Copernican uh, model followed up by this UFO flap there. So this is all, you know, very new to me and it's all stuff that I'm very fascinated about. I'm in the process of actually creating a presentation wow. on it right now yeah. uh, worth looking into, but I believe that's all a setup. That, that Satan had to put things into place, plant a seed, right, that would grow over the centuries and manifest in a massive great deception. And I believe that's why we're getting so much, we're hearing about UFOs, disclosure, uh, you know, alien abductions scenarios being reported more and more, that all this stuff is building up to the point where I would not be surprise in the slightest if we wake up one morning with mile wide spaceships parked over cities like independence there v or what happened in stephenville texas in 2008 that this is coming and what's that going to do to the average christian's faith whose faith is not rooted in the truth of the word of god right. and incidentally it says there uh, was it first or second thessalonians i forget what, where it talks about the great delusion strong delusion it says that because they had not a love of the truth that god will send a strong delusion. It's not coming from Satan or the Antichrist. God sends a strong delusion. Why? Because you don't have a love of the truth. So this is why you know my whole ministry is about, look, guys, right now, our Bible is the anchor. It's the only hmm. compass that we yeah. have in a sea of lies right now. And you know people make fun of me for the things that I teach and believe, but I'm like, look, this is what it says. I'm going to believe it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're with you, Rob. We're right there with you, man. Yeah, we are. Yeah, it's... I mean, I, we, we, you talked a bit about how the great deception too, and I honestly, I mean, I was talking to some buddies about this this week, is that a ton of Christians are going to be deceived in the end, and, and they're already being deceived because they don't know what's in their Bibles. Right. And they come back to this, and it's like, man, everything's in there. I think one of the, one of the greatest efforts I think the enemy makes is to keep Christians from reading their Bible. And not only that, but to keep pastors and teachers from teaching the Bible. Mm -hmm. Instead of getting this motivational speaker crap that gets whirled up and, and spit out, and People don't know how it's supposed to, the end's been written. It's in there. It's all in. All you got to do is read it. And I, I think that that's, that's one of the more fat, like more fascinating things is, is you fall, you know, farther down the rabbit hole or what have you is to realize just how many people don't know what's in there. And they assume that since we live in a culture that is churched, that they know everything in there. And you're in, I think maybe one of the biggest mind grenades this show has been, and Nate and I've been doing this since last year or relatively new in this space is that just how little I did know about these significant things, whether it be Genesis 6, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, these 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 things that are paradigm shifting mm -hmm. when it comes to understanding, you know, the bigger picture. And I think that's maybe the bit maybe what I get from this. And so it's funny that the alien thing is interesting. Um we've had a get we had a guest on here who was coincidentally or not a master mason and he's a big personality on uh, on History Channel and we had no idea what was coming with this, but he, he basically spit out what I believe is that deception, which is that the aliens are here, the ETs are here, they planted us here, they're working with us, and they're going to step in before we destroy ourselves to end all these yep. things that, that we've created. And, and it's the, the problems, the wars, the violence, the bigotry, all these different things that these, these, these you know, the buzzwords and key phrases that we find in, in, in the media that's thrown at us all the time, that they're going to come in and, and end this. And so I wonder... I'm going in the theory that I think that there's, like you said, that we're going to wake up and there'll be ships or there'll be this disclosure where they step out. And I mean, I'm come so far that I think maybe that's even how the Antichrist 
ends up, right? I mean, I can't figure out how else we would have essentially the the world fall under, you know, a one world government. You know, when you have these all these battling ideologies that I, that you can't imagine ever really working together, whether it be Islam and Christianity, and specifically maybe those two. Um, but then communism and and the free market and all these different things that that are at such ideological conflicts, there has to be something crazy, yeah, that happens. That that right? I mean, that's yeah. what I would. Assume. I went to the it, actually they just had it this weekend also, and I would have went to it if I didn't go to the film festival in Tucson. Um, but okay, this is a stack of DVDs, right? <laughs> <laughs> that that from the contact in the desert conference that was uh was two years ago i guess because last year with covid they didn't have it but so i went out there and you know with, with this many presentations obviously you can't go to all of them so you go to the ones right. you can attend uh and then you get the dvds of the ones you, you that you missed so you know and, and and this is all that stuff this is the, the all the ancient aliens crowd hmm. right <laughs> um and the 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 primary message if i could sort of distill that whole stack down is that um, ascension is needed. This and, and, and there's an urgency. Like that entire community, you know, be it the New Age, UFOs, all that's kind of blended into one now. Is that we need to ascend to a higher spiritual plane for what's coming, and what's coming, according to them, is imminent. It's right around the corner. It's 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 right on the verge of happening, right now. And so they had this profound sense of urgency, right that something's coming and I'm looking around and I went there really, to, I just wanted to see what the other side is, is saying, you know, right. I mean, I'm solid in what I believe I knew, knew going into it that I was going to differ from him, but we're, we're all looking at the same evidence. We're just coming up with different conclusions. Right. And uh, did you see the mini series there? that was out a number of years ago, uh, childhood's end Mm-mm. based on, I think it was, a, I think it was Isaac Asimov. No. I think wrote it or anyway, yeah, well, you should check it out. Childhood's End, right? Especially in the context of this conversation. Uh, watch this series. And, you know, essentially it's this disclosure and this alien creature who looks very much like a Satan character comes out and, you know, he's our savior, right? You know, how the Antichrist manifests, you know, I am of the opinion that the Bible tells us everything we need to know. Amos 3, 7, God says that he doesn't do anything except he tells his prophets first what he's going to do, what he's going to do. So he's not going to leave us hanging. You know, Yeshua, Jesus said that the last days would be unlike any other time in human history. Like it's the most significant time, you know, dwarfing even the days of Noah, even though it's likened unto the days of Noah. So I started thinking, well, then is he really going to leave us hanging? Because if he doesn't do anything except he tells the prophets first what he's going to do, is he going to leave us hanging concerning the details of the most significant time in all of human existence? Or is he going to tell us exactly what's going to happen? And I'm of the position he is, he, and he did. Uh, and like as a screenwriter myself and having studied, you know, there's all kinds of books out there like, you know, Save the Cat, right? This is your, the definitive book on screenwriting or the hero's journey, right? You know, how to tell, you know, compelling stories. You know, these are all must reads for writers, right? That right. You, you you do what's called foreshadowing, right? You, you, you set things up in the beginning that, that has a payoff later. Well, I believe that that's exactly what has happened. Isaiah 46, 10, God says he's declared the end from the beginning, i.e. Genesis. So if I want to understand Revelation, I got to go back to Genesis. Mm-hmm. And if you read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, especially in Deuteronomy, uh, when I looked at Exodus, at the plagues of the book of Exodus, and I looked at the plagues of the book of Revelation, I put them together in our spreadsheet side by side. It, they're the same. Mm-hmm. Revelation's an amped up repeat of Exodus. Well, what do you know? Jeremiah said that there's going to be a greater Exodus. This is going to happen. It's going to be so great. This is going to make the exodus of Moses par- pale in comparison. Hmm. So, so and, and then when you read the book of Numbers, I've come to believe that Numbers is a play-by-play roadmap of, of the tribulation, you know, right to the point where, you know, you, it in my mind anyway, it explains 144,000 with the various censuses that were taken. That You know, that you have 1,000 from each of the 12 tribes in the book of Numbers, and then you got 12,000 in Revelation of the 12 tribes, you know, for the 144,000. It's just an amped up repeat, you know, of the whole thing. So, 
then who is the Antichrist? Well, the, the first guy to create a one world system, the new world order, is nothing new. It's, it's a repeat of something that happened before. And then we get that in Genesis chapter 11, right? The whole world is gathered together in the plains of Shinar under the leadership of one guy, Nimrod, who happens to be yeah, yeah. an animal human hybrid <laughs> uh, that did something to corrupt himself and he began to become a giant. And his, his, now we don't really get this in Genesis. All we get in Genesis is that he was trying to build a high tower to reach into heaven. What does that mean? Well, Joshua goes into great detail and tells you that they had basically set up three camps and each of the three camps had a, a different goal, a, an objective to assault heaven, to wipe out the angels, capture the throne room and, and essentially kill God and set up Nimrod as the, the new ruler. And to do this, to avenge the pre-flood world. You know, it's like this, this evil tyrant God wiped out the whole world before. You got to remember Shem, Ham and Japheth lived a hundred years in the pre-flood side of the world, you know, yeah. so they saw a hundred years worth of pre-flood world. So, you know, you, they had to have these campfire discussions, right? Mm -hmm. Where Ham's sitting there talking with his children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. And Nimrod's like, Hey, what was the pre-flood world like? Oh man, it was like this, like that. And you could see Nimrod kind of thinking, how dare he, you know, let's, yeah. let's take him out. Right. So his stated objective is to create a war with God. Well, hmm. that all, that's the perfect foreshadowing for the Antichrist who creates a one world system. Everybody's under his leadership. And what do you know? He wants to make war with the guy coming on the horse, right? Our savior. Yeah. So I'm of the opinion that, that we're looking at a resurrected Nimrod for the Antichrist. And it tells you his name in Revelation 9, the fifth trumpet. It, it, Revelation 17 tells you the beast comes from the bottomless pit. So right away, I know he's not coming from Kenya. He's not coming from New York, the Vatican, or right. anywhere else that we're in Hawaii. You know, he, he, you know, he's no human ruler on this earth. He is the eighth who is of the seven, and he comes from the bottomless pit. We got tremendous detail, open book test, Revelation 17. So I'm not looking for anybody that, to, to be the Antichrist unless he came out of the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that it opens in the, at the fifth trumpet. And Anthony Patch has, has done some interesting work dealing with CERN and the head of Nimrod and occult rituals and things designed around the DNA of Nimrod and the intentions of CERN that could be a way that they bring this character back. But how is he manifested on the public stage? It would make the most sense to me that he manifests himself as a being from another world, yeah, especially if he's a giant. You know, and and th this is why he's, he's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not a you know anything that we would say on Earth, because everybody in the world turns to this guy and is like, "Wow, who is like him? Who can make war with the beast?" And the and the whole world wants to follow this guy. The whole world's not wanting to follow Biden or Trump or Obama or you know pick a character. It's none of these people. It's a supernatural entity. His name is Apollyon. He's given his name is given for you. In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, Apollyon is a Greek name. Uh, Hebrew is Abaddon. Apollyon is a derivative spelling of Apollo. Apollo is the son of Zeus. Right? Yeah. So there you go. Is that, same with, is that the same with Osiris? Is that the same? Yeah, it's synonymous. Um, th there's lots of scholars out there who have connected Nimrod to various characters of antiquity. And it, it starts to make sense when you realize that the whole world was gathered in one language following one guy. And Joshua says that there's 600,000 men you know, not counting women and children on earth at the time of the Tower of Babel. And, and that, that uh, when God came down and confounded their languages, he split them up into 70 languages, 70 different people groups. And I think uh, Dr. Michael Heiser has done a great job with the divine council uh, and talking about principalities and powers that went out and, and that became the rulers essentially of the 70 nations, right? Well, I mean, it's been 69 with Yahuwah, you know, choosing Abraham for Israel, you know, right? So you got 69 to one, you know, and God's telling the devil, okay, give it your best shot, right? Here we go. Right. But yeah. they went away, 70 different languages, 70 different people groups, all talking about the same guy now in different languages. So he takes on different names and over time an embellishment, you know, as they start to embellish stories and create mythologies around this deity, God, man, uh, you know, the, you start to look at synchronicities that Ninurta and Ningursu and Osiris and the, all these different characters that, that either have same attributes or are known for doing something, you know, very similar, like building a large structure, you know, um, you know, that could reach into heaven kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the whole, why does the whole world worship the beast? Because they already are and they have been for thousands of years. You know, the governments of the world are in league already 
with a beast system that has been developing, you know, over the millennia uh, to the point where there's going to come, you know, convergence and they're all going to come together and they're all going to unite under the very being that they've already been serving in various forms Hmm. for thousands of years. So, so my question is, you know, when I'm thinking about this, it's, it's hard not to get anxiety about all this. It's hard not to be a little bit, you know, get afraid, have some fear. And I think a little bit of fear is good at times, but what do we do? I mean, how do we combat this, this mess, this heaviness, this ultimate, I don't know, just, that's my question. Like, yeah, well, I I think anybody that goes down this path of research asks that question sometimes in fear and trembling and tears (laughs) accompanying, uh, because you're like, what do I do? You know, and frankly, I, I have many a night that I'm lamenting going father, like, you got to give us a fighting chance here or we're all screwed. You know, like, yeah, help us out here. You know, what do we do? And for me, I mean, I have a lot of the questions and the concerns and the anxieties that you expressed a minute ago there, Nate. And the only thing that keeps coming back to me is get on God's page. Because if, if we're on his page doing his things his way, then we will be in the right place at the right time to hear his voice, to act and to do what he says to do when he says to do it. And I believe that there is a, a, a hiding place for the righteous, you know, the, the five wise virgins go in, not up. I don't believe in a pre trip rapture. They go in to an earthbound place of safety while the foolish are there going, Hey, you know, let us in. No, nope, sorry, too late. And who are the 10 virgins? Well, virgin, you know, is pure. Well, the only ones that fit that description are Christians because we're made pure through the blood of Christ. We have no purity of our own, but we have righteousness through his blood. So we, and they're waiting for the bridegroom. Nobody else is waiting for a bridegroom. So all 10 have to be Christians in my opinion, but five go in and five are left out. And I believe that, that that's a, a warning to us is that, you know, what is the oil? What is the lamp? Well, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, right? And the oil is likened to the Holy Spirit. So if I read the scriptures, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me, I'm of the opinion that I am hopefully, I prayerfully uh, in the variety of the wise virgins, right? Made pure through the blood of Christ, obeying him, that will be ready when he comes, right? And won't be freaking out at, you know, let me in. I don't have enough oil. I didn't, I didn't do it right, you know? So I don't have all the answers. All I know is that the best chance I think we have is to get on his page, do things his way, obey him, listen, you know, and be ready to go when he says go. Because it says that things are going to happen, that, 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 Things are men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of the things that are coming on the earth. And other book, like I think it's a fourth Esdras, I believe, talks about in the end times, pregnant women will give birth to monsters. <laughs> You're like, what? Uh, in the Septuagint version of Isaiah, forgive me, I forget. I think it's chapter 13, but I could be wrong about that. But it talks about speak to the gates, ye ruler, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. You talk about the Joel 2 army, you talk about the scorpion hybrid centaurs that come up out of the bottomless pit. Well, centaurs, if you read about the locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9, they are described as chimeric centaurs. Well, centaurs, according to Greek mythology, come from the father, who uh, a guy named Centaurus, who is the son of Apollo. Well, Revelation tells you that their leader is Apollo. It's Apollo, Apollo 9, you know, chap, uh, Revelation chapter 9, Apollyon. And, and, and so people who take the mark of the beast, I am of the opinion that they receive genetic markers of the beast himself, that it is a counterfeit immortality because we see that people beg for death, but death flees from them. As a result, they're cast alive into the lake of fire. And so we know as Christians that we have our salvation through what? Our salvation was purchased through the shed blood of the lamb, Yeshua. He shed his blood. I believe in him. We're covered in the blood, so to speak. We receive salvation through the shed blood of Christ. Well, I believe the Antichrist, Satan is always an a counterfeiter. It's going to be antithesis. I believe he's going to offer salvation from whatever pandemic they create through some sort of vaccination, probably that will have genetic codes from him that will great. What do you know? It cures this disease that we created, but it also gives you some interesting side effects, namely being unredeemable and being cast alive at the lake of fire and begging for death, but death will flee from you. And the scorpion people that come up out of the bottomless pit, 200 million of them, incidentally, uh, they're not the Chinese. <laughs> you know, th- these are chimeric centaur hybrid scorpion creatures, horsemen, horsemen, 
<laughs> There's only 67 million horses on the whole earth. So how do you get 200 million screaming Chinamen on 67 million horses? <laughs> you know, that doesn't right. work out. There's 200 million of these chimeric centaur creatures coming out and they sting those who took the mark. You know, like this is scary stuff. It's crazy stuff. Look, it's, I just picture like the mummy. And, yeah, you know, exactly. Brendan, Brendan, Brendan oh. Fraser's trying to save us all. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> feels like the, the plagues of Egypt a little bit too. Well, it is. It's an amped up repeat. Hmm. Yeah. Man. Man. It's heavy. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. heavy, Rob. Like, yeah, it is. I, mean, I grew up in the church my whole life. I've heard this stuff and I'm just trying to find that balance because, you know, we're supposed to have the fruits of the spirit at the same time. You know what I mean? We're supposed to have that. Uh, we're not supposed to have a spirit of fear, mm-hmm. you know? So it's hard. It's hard for me. I think I struggle with fear off and on my whole life. I'm a little bit of a, you know, when it comes to medical procedures, I, I avoid the doctor like the plague. So I hate that stuff. Yeah. I have to I have to hope that Christ is going to save us, help us. I know that some people will be deceived and you see it all over the place now that people believe so many lies, but I just I just can't I just can't believe that God would just let his people be completely sidetracked. I mean, what the Holy Spirit's guiding us, right? I mean, even just doing a show like this, like Luke and I will be talking about something and things will happen and it feels like we see these little instances where it feels like, man, there's some narrative being told here that we're not, that we're trying to be obedient to what we feel God is leading us to do to get this truth out to people. All I have to say is it's just heavy. I just, I hope it's a little more tame. (laughs) I I think it's going to be more horrific than we are even capable of imagining, frankly. But I, I, the hope that I have in all of it, it used to be preacher rapture. I used to be like, yeah, we're getting out of here. Uh, you know, I don't know where you guys are on that. This was just something that, you know, about 10 years ago, I began to realize, no, that's not happening. <laughs> and, and immediately I started freaking out because I, you know, I'm 52 years old for over 40 years. I didn't think I was going to have to deal with it, you know? And then all of a sudden I'm confronted with the idea that, you know, if this preacher rapture thing's not true, and I think the Bible is pretty clear that it's not true, then, uh Oh, Like we're going to have to deal with this. And I, you know, 42 years of my life, you know, at that time I hadn't prepared for it. So immediately I start kicking into God, gold, guns, and groceries mode. (laughs) It's like, we're going to stock up on the four G's. Right. And, but I didn't have the money for it. You know, God, sure. That you didn't require any money, but the gold guns and groceries did, you know, (laughs) uh, didn't have the money. Didn't, you know, we're living in a small apartment. It's like, you know, well, how are we going to, you know, at the time when I got this revelation, I am freaking out big time (laughs) because, there's nothing I'm completely, I'm completely ill prepared for it. Um, but but when I think about the Israelites in in their bondage and all of the stuff that they experienced in the slavery that they were in, that was pretty bad. I mean, that was pretty horrific. And then it got worse in the plagues when the ten plagues came. You got to remember the Israelites experienced three of the ten, so they experienced some of it. But for the remainder, the remaining seven, when it got really bad. They were preserved in an earthbound place of safety called Goshen, which Yahuwah had already established for the house of Israel when Jacob and his family came down. Joseph was sold into slavery. Remember, his brothers sold him off. And, you know, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, right? He redeemed it, made Joseph second in charge. And because Joseph's position is second only to Pharaoh, he was able to save his whole family, the 70 members of the house of Jacob that came down, and they were given the land of Goshen way back, you know, in the days of Joseph. And then 215 years later, when you get to Moses, that's our, they're already established in Goshen. So they were preserved during the worst parts of it. Now, I am, if I was not of the tribe of Israel and was not preserved in Goshen, but I was watching what was happening, if I'm an Egyptian, right? And I'm watching what's happening to the Israelites and everything else, what's happening to everybody, but they're okay. You know, uh, when they went out to kill the lamb and put the blood on the door, I'd have been like, honey, I don't know what those guys are doing over there. Go get a lamb and kill it, <laughs> you know? And I'd be painting blood on the door because the, the command was to do that. And if you did, it didn't say only Israel, if you do it, it said, if you did, the, the angel of death will pass over and, you know, the firstborn will live. If not, the firstborn, whether Israelite or Egyptian or otherwise, will die. So there are many Egyptians and other people groups that went out in the mixed rabble with Israel during the Exodus. Why? Because they obeyed God. They, they, they did what the God of Israel was telling them to do, you know, whether they're Israel or not. And so they got to go out with them. 
So I believe that there, and, and when I was freaking out about this big time, I went to a Passover conference in Denver, Colorado, and Pastor Norm Franz was preaching a message, and I'm in freak out mode. And he said, you know what? Your Goshen is wherever God has you. Poof, that just set me free right there because my Goshen right now is North Dallas, Texas. This is where he has me. You know, and I believe if I'm being obedient to him, that when the call comes, I could walk out the door of this room right there and end up wherever he wants me to be. Philip got transported. Why not? The key to our survival is obedience. Mm -hmm. We listen to him. We obey him. We do what the scriptures say. We're not going to do it perfectly, but you know what? Your first John chapter two through five is my go-to place. I'm not talking about legalism here. It says those who love me will obey me, right? The, this is the love of God. First John chapter five, this is the love of God that, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. First John chapter two says, I'm writing these things to you, little children, that you do not sin. First John chapter three says, sin is transgression of the law. So he's saying, I'm writing this, that you don't transgress the law. But if you do, recognizing that we all screw up, then we have an advocate. Christ Jesus, the righteous. Ooh, this is Romans 7 versus Romans 8, right? Romans 7, Paul's like, the things I should do, I don't do. The things I don't do, I should do. He's like, oh, wretched man, who's going to save me, right? You turn to Romans chapter 8, and he's like, oh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Amen. Right on. Right. Rock on, right? So what do we do? We do our best. We try to obey God. We fall. We get back up again. We have an advocate. Awesome. But the key phrase there is we should be trying to obey him. It's important because when daddy says go, we need to go. When he says stay, we need to stay. When he says do this or do that, we need to do it because it's for our own good, right? So your Goshen, Nate, Luke, anybody else listening out there is wherever God has you. <laughs> Where you are right now is your Goshen. Now we may experience three of the 10 plagues, so to speak. We're going to experience some rough times, you know, but if we're really obe obedient and following him and walking in his ways, and I have to believe if in fact Revelation is an amped up repeat of Exodus, that we're going to be preserved in our Exodus experience in our Goshen, you know, from the, the worst of the worst. And I actually had a vision, uh, and I believe it was a vision. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a dream. It was very vivid that I was eating at a banquet table with different people. It was a lot of people at this banquet table. And at the far end of this long table was a glowing figure that I believe was Yeshua at the end of the table. And we're having this amazing banquet. And we were inside this glass bubble. And outside of the bubble was absolutely horrific carnage everywhere you look, just, just horrific. And I heard in that vision, I have prepared a table for you in the midst of your enemies. You know, and David had that, you know, David wrote that. Um, and David went through some rough times, right? But why was David a man after his own heart? Well, read Psalm 119, right? It tells you why David was a man after his own heart. If we get into the David mode, then I believe that we will be sharing a meal at that table preserved while absolute carnage is happening all around us. Hmm. Hmm. You know, a thousand fall to the left. It's Psalm 91. Yeah. It's the assurance. Yeah. That's the assurance of God. Same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Psalm 91. It, 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 the thing I like about the Bible is it, it, it's not shy about hiding all the warts and, and, and troubles of the people. You know, it doesn't paint the authors of scripture or the characters of scripture. You know, we, the Catholic church paints them as saints with you know halos around their head, but they all screwed up. They all had issues, right? They're all just like you and me. We're no different than they are. They're no different than we are. You know, the, the only difference is they listened and obeyed and sometimes they didn't. And we saw what happened to them when they didn't, you know, but, Look, uh, my whole thing is, I'm, I love the Bible. I'm extremely grateful for it. I, I, you know, I am so blessed to have it. I'm glad we do. But I want to get to a place where I walk like the people in the Bible who didn't have a Bible did. You know, like Adam didn't have a Bible. Enoch didn't have a Bible. Noah didn't have a Bible. Abraham didn't have a Bible. And look what God did through these people. You know, uh, so it, while I'm extremely grateful for the scriptures, it helps me to understand my creator. I want to really get to know the author of it you know, so that he sort of starts writing chapters, you know, with me in it, <laughs> you know, right. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're about an hour and a half into this and uh, that's kind of where we, where we like to keep our shows. Okay. Uh, um, Rob, yeah, yeah, Rob, before you go though, tell us about seed. I mean, cause yeah. you have it on your, and I know that our listeners will want to be able to we can talk about where to find you and stuff, but tell us about seed. Cause you just came back from the film festival and yeah, people aren't familiar, we'd love to hear about. Yeah. Well, thank you, brother. Um, yeah. I, I realized, you know, I've published a number of books that become Amazon bestsellers and that's cool. I've, 
traveled the world doing conferences and made YouTube videos. And that's cool. But you know what? We're only reaching a few hundred thousand people, maybe a couple million at best, you know, and you know, that's the same with any content producer out there, you know, and, but you put it in a fictional narrative and you reach the world, <laughs> you know, as a missionary, I was a missionary for almost seven years, traveled to over a dozen countries. I could go anywhere. I was in the jungles of Northeast India, houses on stilts, you know, in the jungle. And through an interpreter, I could ask, where does the phrase, may the force be with you? And they all know it. Everybody knows it. I could ask them to quote John 3.16. Nobody knows it. <laughs> you know, uh, so who's more effective, right? And, and George Lucas, uh, he was speaking at a, a groundbreaking ceremony, said that for better or worse, the church, which used to be all powerful, has been usurped by film. I believe he's right. I don't think the church has been even close to being as remotely culturally relevant as the film industry has. Hmm. Uh, everything from what people are wearing on their T-shirts, everything that's happening in the world right now is 100% being driven by mainstream media. Hmm. And in my opinion, Christians have abdicated their position of influence in that realm. And I'm trying to change that. Uh, so Seed is a TV series that was downloaded into my head in, the, in Tucson in, two, in the summer, excuse me, in the winter of 2009. And it's meant to be a six season TV series, 12 episodes per season, 72 episodes total that is meant to tell the whole story beginning with the fall of Satan all the way through to the time of revelation, but doing it in a hopefully really cool, intriguing sci-fi kind of fantasy type of lost type of way. I pitch it as lost meets the unit wrapped up in the X-Files. So if you can imagine I love that. the mystery and intrigue of lost with the special forces appeal of the unit uh, dealing with X-Files type of scenarios, it, it's meant to be served on a secular palette, but of course it's being written and produced from a biblical worldview. So it's never going to be preachy. One of the reasons I call it seed is because I'm just planting seeds that you guys who are savvy can water with your friends and family, hopefully watching this cool TV show that, Hey, did you see that last night in seed? Yeah. Well, this is, look, check this out in the Bible. You know, I've learned through being an evangelist my entire life that salvation comes through relationship. You know, your friends and family. I don't, you have that relationship. I can just put compelling images on the screen and you can do the follow-up. That was something Mel Gibson, when he released The Passion, the evangelical leaders in the country got behind it, but they, it was so powerful. They wanted Mel Gibson to put a invitation at the end of the movie to accept Christ. And he basically looked at him and said, no, guys, like, look, that's not my job. That's your job. He said, my job is to put compelling images up on that screen. Your job is to do the follow-up. And when I heard him say that, I was like, that's my marching orders right there. So, Basically, if you could take all the research I've ever done and have become known for over the last 20 years and that of others, there's plenty of research from Steve Quayle, Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli, and everybody else, Mike Heiser, and everybody is in there also. I'm trying to package all this cool and intriguing stuff up and put it in a vehicle that can reach 7.5 billion people. <laughs> so that's the goal. That's the project. That. Seedtheseries.com is the website. And they can find it online. Yeah. Is it, I mean, you're saying you're at film festival. So yeah. is well, eventually yeah, we just, it'll be streaming or? Yeah, it'll be streaming on its own platform, sort of like The Chosen. Uh, it would be an app driven uh, distribution model. But, but we've only done the first eight minutes, uh, the, the teaser for the pilot episode. That's all. I, it's expensive, dude. <laughs> it's like, oh, bet. you know, uh, to compete with the world, you know, we've got to have the same budget that they have. And I'm on the low end in my projections of three to four million dollars per episode. Most of the stuff you're watching on TV is four to ten million dollars per episode. Mandalorian, that's like fifteen million dollars an episode. So you know we're in the the low end, three to four million per episode. We, we raised a hundred thousand. I took it and went, went and made eight minutes <laughs> with that. Wow. Uh, and that's available. People can check that out on my YouTube channel, uh, which is just my name, Rob Skiba, or go to seedtheseries.com. Awesome. Well, I'm encouraged you wrote six seasons because being a huge fan of Lost, you figured out they probably only wrote about three or four seasons and then they just started making it up. Because, yeah, yeah, after the four seasons. Because of the, yeah, you're like, what is, yeah. well, now they're all dead. When I'm yeah. watching The Sixth Sense, they're all dead. I, I don't know how this is really out of deal with this. They think it just ran out of They got out Lost of making Lost. And I, I mean, I love that show, right? Like the, the sixth, seventh season, but you're kind of like, man, they just- They lost they it planned, after- They planned really well for three or four seasons and then it just kind of- it, yeah, but they, it came you know, off the rails. There was, it, I know where you got to go, but uh, I'll just say this. This is an example of how to do effective seeding. They did that very well in the beginning, uh, like the first few seasons of Lost. There's a character in season two named Echo. He's like this big black guy. He had a oh, yeah. walking stick. Oh, yeah. And they yep. used to show him like carving in his walking stick, but they didn't show what he was carving. 
right? They just showed him. And, but then one episode, they did an over the shoulder shot for like, I don't know, a second or two. If you blink, you missed it kind of thing. And they showed what he was carving. And he was carving scripture, ad, excuse me, scripture addresses. Well, what does that cause you to do? If, especially if you're watching it on streaming, you know, platforms or on DVD, you're going to hit rewind. You're going to hit pause. You're like, what is echo carving, right? So then you, yeah. what does it cause you? You went and you opened up your Bible and you're looking up the Bible verses the echo was carving in the stick because it has something to do with the theme of that episode. That's genius. And I'm like, yeah. okay, whatever I can do to plant a seed to get you guys in, in the audience to open your Bible. Scripture says he, his word will not return void. All I got to do is get you in there. If I get you in there, the Holy Spirit takes over. So, you know, that that's the goal. That's the technique. That's the, you know, the way we're trying to do it. Hmm. Love it, bro. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, that's needed, man. That's, you know, media is just, I mean, yeah, we need, we need to take back some of that space. Well, for the you kingdom. Know, yeah. We talk about the things that we talk about here and many times, you know, especially when we look around, it seems like tomorrow's the end of the world. I mean, it really does. If it's like, we're, you know, if we're not in the tribulation, we're like on the doorstep, you know, it feels like it. And I start to question myself like, God, why am I, you know, messing, you know, I'm making seed comic books and stuff. It's like, what, what, what am I, what am I doing here? What am I, right. you know, if it's the end of the world tomorrow, why am I doing this? You know, but I know he called me to this. He literally pulled me out of the full-time ministry that I had and called me to this in 2009 and has confirmed with multiple you know, confirmations over the last 11 years. But I prayed when I submitted this eight minutes uh, to uh, 17 film festivals. I prayed, Father, you know you know my heart. You know I want to do Occupy till you come. It feels like tomorrow's the end of the world. I wonder if I'm doing the right thing. If I should keep doing this, I, I prayed for confirmation. I said, let me win at least three industry awards you know at the film festivals well i submitted to 17 film festivals I've, there's only been four that have happened the rest have yet to occur and we've already won nine <laughs> i just won seven in tucson this over the weekend that's fantastic. so i'm like awesome. all right father that seems like hey, god god's number of completion <laughs> yeah right you, yeah that's no accident that feels like confirmation to me so yeah it does i'll just keep marching forward you know well we appreciate you yeah thanks for the time and thanks guys um and people yeah so the website where they can look at the, watch the trailer? Yeah, it's feedtheseries.com is my website. And my, my primary website is robschannel.com. And you can get to everywhere else from there. That's like a hub. You'll take it. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Right, Thanks for the time. Totally appreciate you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. When will, uh, where is this going to air? Uh, it's a uh, podcast. So we'll, we'll. So it'll be on, on every platform oh, that right. we have. It'll be on Apple and Spotify. And oh, very cool. On our website and whatever the other ones, Nate, I don't even know. Anchor. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, awesome. Yeah. It just gets just distributed. Audio? Just, the audio. just the audio. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah send me a link. Uh, so, so when you're showing pictures, they're not going to see them, but we know what you're showing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. All right. Yeah. Awesome, guys. I appreciate yeah, man. it. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Awesome. Awesome.